Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Microsoft's Chief Research Officer, Rick Rashid. Well, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you to sunny Seattle. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when I got here an hour ago, it was snowing, so I won't be able to do that. But I will welcome you to TechFest 2012. I mean, this is, for me at least, you know, one of my favorite times of the year because it's an opportunity for us to get uh, so many of our researchers from around the world, you know, here in one place, showing off a lot of their ideas and a lot of the technologies they, they've been developing. Uh, and having a chance to interact with our product groups and, of course, having a chance to interact with you. So let me get moving on this. Now, uh, as the video just, just showed, uh, I came to Microsoft uh, 20 years ago, actually now 20 and a half uh, to be precise, September of 1991. And I came uh, to create Microsoft Research, to really start a fundamental basic research lab in the context of a software company, which is Microsoft. Now, the idea of Microsoft Research really started with a, a memo that uh, Nathan Mirvold, who was one of the people featured in that video, uh, wrote to the board of directors of Microsoft in 1990, uh, really saying that, that he felt that it was important that Microsoft make fundamental investments in computer science in order for it to be able to, th to thrive and grow for the long-term future. Now, it was unusual in a sense to be making that kind of an argument in the context of a company like Microsoft back then, because Microsoft was a very small company. We only had a few thousand employees. Uh, we were just crossing over $1 billion in sales. And so it wasn't really clear that a company of that size would necessarily want to invest uh, and make that kind of commitment to long-term fundamental basic research. But I think it's a statement about Microsoft. I think it's a statement about our vision as a company that that we do tend to look at the long term. We, we, we try to play the long game. And so the decision was made by the board in 1990 to start uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, they reached out, they hired me, brought me in in, in uh, September of 1991. And we've been building the lab ever since then. Now, through that whole period, we've always had a single mission. We've had the advantage, we've always had the same person running the organization, that's me. Uh, and I've always had the same mission. I haven't been, been messing with my mission statement. Uh, and this is the mission here. The key thing is to expand the state of the art in the areas that we do research. That's really our most important uh, activity. Because if we're not doing that, if we're not really pushing the frontiers, then we're not really going to be that valuable as an organization to a company like Microsoft. Obviously, when we have great ideas, when things make sense, then that's the second part of our mission statement, which is we work really hard to get those ideas into our products. You'll see more about that in, um, in a bit. And then finally, the sort of overarching value um, that we bring uh, to the company is really embodied in that third point, which is you know, we're really here to make sure that Microsoft will be here you know, 10 years from now, 15 years now, or 20 years from now. If you think back 20 years ago when, when Microsoft Research was started, uh, very few of the companies that were Microsoft peers at that time still exist today. I mean, the, the technology industry is a, is a constantly changing industry. You need to constantly be able to change. And having a fundamental basic research group like Microsoft Research gives Microsoft that ability to be agile and to change. Now, we've grown from a, a very small group uh, to uh, what is really now one of the largest basic research groups in the field of computer science. Uh, you see on the slide here you know, all, all the different locations that we have. We have six uh, sort of uh, significant locations for doing basic research here in Redmond, uh, Microsoft Research Redmond. Our second largest lab is in Beijing. Uh, our third largest lab is in Cambridge, England. Uh, we have Bangalore, India. Uh, we have uh, New England and uh, Mountain View, California. But we also have other groups around the country as well. We have a small group uh, doing quantum computing in Santa Barbara. We have joint research uh, arrangements with uh, INRIA in Paris. Uh, we have uh, advanced technology teams. Uh, they're doing sort of advanced development work in Germany, in uh, Egypt, and in Israel. So it gives you a sense of the, the reach and the breadth of the organization as it's grown. We have about 850 uh, PhD researchers at Microsoft Research. To put that in perspective, that means about 1% of all Microsoft employees are 
PhD researchers doing fundamental basic research, which is a pretty significant uh, fraction of the corporation. We cover a very broad range of research, and uh, you'll see some of that today as you look around some of the exhibits that you'll be looking at. Uh, but, but we cover not just all the traditional areas of computer science, but we even reach out into what are increasingly becoming uh, other areas of science that computer science is, is bleeding into, whether that be in areas like biology and chemistry and physics and environmental sciences. Increasingly, we're a part of those communities as well because the entire field of computer science is, has, in, in a sense, uh, you know, merged into uh, those areas. Uh, one of the reasons we have a global organization, and you saw that from the previous slide, is because we are really about hiring the best and the brightest people from around the world. You know, in some sense, the, you know, people often ask me, you know, how do you decide you know, what you're doing research on and how do you decide you know, what are the, the key areas that you're going to invest in. And I don't invest in, in, in specific research projects. I don't invest in specific areas. I invest in people. We try to hire the best and brightest people wherever we can find them because that's what really drives long-term research. That's what really drives the innovations and the breakthroughs that are important to the company. Uh, the impact we have is really stretches across all of Microsoft's products. And uh, I think this slide does a good, good, gives you kind of a sense of it. Uh, really, there isn't a product that my, Microsoft produces that doesn't have either technology from Microsoft Research in it or, or wasn't built with technology from Microsoft Research. I mean, the impact we've had across our entire product line has been enormous. And really, you know, when you know, I was a university professor before coming to Microsoft, one of the reasons I came to Microsoft to start Microsoft Research was to have that kind of an impact. It was to make sure that the ideas, the, the technologies, the artifacts that we created in computer science research would have the ability to change the world and impact people. And we do that through our products and the things that we create. One way of thinking about research you know, is, uh, is to think about it using you know, what we sometimes refer to as a four-quadrant uh, uh, diagram, which uh, I got from uh, Peter Lee, who heads up our research lab here in Redmond. And it gives you a sense of, of the, the kinds of, of research that we do. You know, so over in the, uh, uh, the lower left-hand corner there, you know, we do a lot of work that, that really enhances the mission of our product teams, that makes those products better in fundamental ways. So if you use a Windows phone, you use the, 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 the um, a text input facility there. Uh, the fact that it is so smart about the things that you're texting and can recognize what you're doing, that comes out of research work that we've done. Uh, the, if you use Bing, uh, you know, the, our ability to have Bing be competitive uh, with Google in the marketplace and really exceed it in a number of areas has really come from the long-term investments we've made in information uh, in uh, information uh, retrieval technology uh, that is now embedded in our Bing products. And increasingly, we're taking Bing in new directions based on our research. Uh, we also s create technologies that sustain our products. So you may, uh, again, I mentioned the, some of the technologies we've created that really enhance the way we build our products. We've added new proof tools to be able to prove properties of our programs so that we can eliminate large categories of bugs. We've added fuzzy logic to be able to uh, do uh, analysis of our, our software systems to find problems that would be very difficult to find any other way. Uh, and we've also taken the technologies we've created and, and enhanced our products in significant ways. So if you uh, use Bing Translator, which is really a, a, an exploding service for us, uh, it's up 600% just in the, last, in the last year in terms of access. And, and the queries through uh, our translation facility are just going through the roof. You know, that's technology that's based on long-term investments in fundamental basic research, really understanding how to be able to do translation. And in fact, one of the booths you'll see uh, when you go out is work that we're doing to bring the entire community in, uh, the language community, so that we can translate all languages uh, from one to another uh, and make that kind of a, de a democratic and e egalitarian uh, world out there where it isn't just one organization uh, deciding what languages get translated, but in fact the large community of people and the 
hundreds and hundreds of languages that are out there will be able to be translated in the future. Now, I wanted to, uh, you know, th today we're going to be, you know, I think in the demos that you'll be seeing, we'll be emphasizing a couple of key areas. Uh, and I wanted to uh, uh, highlight those and give you a couple of demonstrations so you have a chance to see some of the things that you'll be looking at in the demo bo booths later today. One of the, the trends, one of the things that's happening, and certainly Microsoft Research has been leading the, 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 the drive in that area, is, is this notion that increasingly the virtual and the physical worlds are merging. I mean, part of this is happening because we're giving computers the same senses that we have. We're giving them the ability to see. Uh, we're giving them the ability to hear and to understand. We're giving them the ability to speak, uh, to touch, uh, to feel, uh, to know where they are, uh, to sense motion. I mean, those are the kinds of things that we think of as sort of unique to humans, and yet now our computers are capable of doing those same things. As that happens, we're changing the kinds of applications that computers can be used for, and we're changing the way in which we interact with them. Uh, you see that with the, some of the technologies we've been in, introducing, uh, such as Microsoft Connect, where suddenly we've given the computer the ability to see in three dimensions in real time, to recognize what a person is doing and how they're interacting with, with the, the world. Uh, and that's just changing the way people perceive the, the relationship between a computer and an individual. Uh, so you'll be seeing a, a number of, of demonstrations of that type today. Uh, I'm going to bring on stage uh, Dr. Frank Song. He's going to talk about uh, some work that we've been doing in our Microsoft Research Asia lab, you know, specifically to address the problem of how do we make our computers speak, uh, and in particular, how can we make them speak in multiple languages with a single voice. So Frank, can you uh, show us what you've been working on? Thank you, Rick. So the next few minutes, and I'm going to tell you about TTS, or text-to-speech synthesis, and the, how to start a, say, English uh, text-to-speech system. And uh, we'll just go out, find an English speaker, collect speech data, and then train the TTS. Easy and simple. Similarly, we can do that for other language. But how about you have a monolingual speaker, you like his English, the TTS output, but unfortunately he's uh, monolingual. Can we train a different language TTS for his voice? So this is really the challenge. A typical scenario that you do have mixed coded or multi-language uh, text to be read out or to be said by the TTS system. Uh, for example, a car navigation TTS and for American driving in Beijing, if it's uh, brave enough to do that, and this is the a typical mixed-coded driving instructions, and the the major instruction driving instruction turn left, turn right are in English, and the the key terms landmarks, street names, are in Chinese. But can we do that? There are really serious challenges. So the, what we want to have is a, really a mixed lingual or multilingual TTS, but we still want the whole output to be seamless, to be spoken out in a consistent one single voice. Hopefully there's no gaps, no artifacts, glitches between transitions. And of course, you can find an easy way out and say, find a truly fluent bilingual speaker to record both Chinese and English and train those two TTS systems and merge them together. Uh, but of course, it's not always easy. Probably you like his English, but you don't like his uh, Chinese or the other way around. And so the challenge is really, can we do that using monolingual, say, English uh, data to train a Chinese uh, TTS? And to make the whole thing even more complicated or more challenging, because there are so many possible combinations, uh, just the pairs or even triple or multiple language in one, cont uh, in one text. And so let me just show you what we have done. This is really a 
monolingual female speaker, TTS, and then we use that training data to train the corresponding Chinese and mix them together in the output. So this is the driving instruction that I showed you earlier. Oh, sorry. Driving directions to Beijing Railway Station. Head south on Zhongguan Sun Nan Da Jie, then toward Da Hui Si Lu. Turn left at Bai Shi Xin Qiao. Continue on to Xi Zhi Men Wai Da Jie. I hope that I convince you, and the voice is consistent. So from Chinese to English or English to Chinese, still in one consistent female voice. So the idea or the algorithm, how, we, how can we do it? It's really starting with we use a reference Chinese speaker, and the Chinese speaker sentence, we constructed the parameter trajectory, the fundamental frequency, the gain, the loudness, the spectral short time spectral information. But that, that's re reference Chinese speaker. And we need to warp or to equalize the difference between the monolingual English speaker and this reference Chinese speaker. So we warp the trajectory toward that target English monolingual speaker. And then once we warp that, then we can do this uh, uh, so-called sausage we break the English database into pieces, very small pieces. In this case, five milliseconds a piece. And then construct all the pieces which is closest, which are closest to the uh, trajectory of the warp uh, Chinese sentence. And then so we form a sausage-like uh, network. So within the network, we do the optimal search to find what is the truly the best concatenation of all these uh, sequence of tiles. And once we do that, then we make one sentence. We can do that for many, many uh, training sentences. And once we have those training sentences, then we can train our Chinese TTS. And so the, using the same technology, and then we try our boss, and uh, Rick. Rick? OK, so the, what are you going to make me do now? Uh, well, <laughs> the, I know you are more than monolingual. And, but how about Spanish? No, I don't speak Spanish, I'm oh. afraid. Well, all right. So here is the English. And the, so let's try to see how the TTS will speak out in Rick's voice, but in Spanish. Bienvenido a TechFest 2012, donde hoy se podrá ver de primera mano cómo Microsoft Research está estudiando las tendencias tecnológicas clave que definirán el siglo XXI. Or another question asking where to take, uh, how to take the train from Madrid to Barcelona. Disculpe, me puede decir cómo tomar el tren de Madrid a Barcelona? That's all train from Rick's uh, English recordings about one hour. And so, so this is like putting words in your boss's mouth, right? Uh, yeah, basic, right, so. basically. <laughs> and the, could I ask for a race? <laughs> only in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> only in Spanish. So next time, we'll make a Chinese one. Actually, we do have a Chinese one for you, too. All right. So I'll, the, I'll have to try that next yeah. time in China. Uh, so to make the whole thing even more virtual, and so the, the Rick's boss, uh, Craig Mundy, and uh, too busy, so we only got one hour while he was staying in Beijing, and to do video and audio recording of his English. And the uh, one thing I'm pretty sure that he doesn't speak uh, Chinese. I think probably some other language. So using that data, we construct uh, Craig's uh, English TTS plus his talking head or the avatar, 3D avatar. And so here is the. Hello everyone, I'm Craig Mundy, and it's my pleasure to be here today. With the help of this system, now I can speak Mandarin. All right, here comes the Mandarin. Thank you. So, actually, to summarize, 
So with this technology, a train multilingual TTS with only monolingual data from a speaker, and we will be able to do quite a few possible scenario applications, such as learning a foreign language to motivate the user or the learners to use his own voice in his mother tongue and to synthesize, if you try harder, you can achieve this kind of level. Or speech-to-speech -speech translation, and so for monolingual speaker traveling in a foreign country, we'll do speech recognition followed by translation, followed by the final TTS output will be output in a different language, but still in his own voice. Or uh, any kind of mis-coded mis multi-language uh, text can be read out. Uh, so here is the URL, and welcome to our booth, and we'll show you the real-time demo, and we have a real-time machine r r ready for running uh, mixed mix, uh, uh, text uh, input. Great. Thanks, Frank. Thank Thanks you. very much. So another uh, area, another trend uh, that's going on right now that uh, we're highlighting today at TechFest is, is what you know, some people are talking about in terms of big data or the cloud. This idea that now that we have enormous amounts of storage, petabytes of storage, you know, we can bring into a single data center you know, 100,000 machines, and we can, we can talk about building uh, uh, data systems that allow us to really understand uh, the, the, the vast amounts of knowledge that we can collect in ways that we weren't able to do before. Uh, really give us new insights, whether it's insights into our businesses, insights into our um, into our cells, into our biology, uh, insights into the astronomy, uh, or insights into the planet and, and the environment. So it's, it's really, again, a way of thinking about solving the world's problems that's now new and different, and it's really uh, gated by technologies like Windows Azure. So I'm going to bring on stage uh, Dr. Drew Purvis. Uh, Drew heads up our uh, Computational Ecology and Environmental Sciences group at Microsoft Research Cambridge. And Drew's going to talk about some of the work that they've been doing in terms of building tools that really can analyze and process huge amounts of information in novel ways. And of course, one of the most, uh, one of the, the biggest sources of information is the planet itself. Drew? Thank you, Rick. Hi, everyone. I'm very excited today to be able to show you something called Fetch Climate, a tool that's uh, come out of my group in uh, uh, in Cambridge. The Fetch Climate allows experts and non-experts alike to very easily extract complex climate information. Um, climate has a special meaning. Climate is, it describes a typical pattern of weather that you can expect to experience at different times and places around the world. Um, people often say climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. As we all know, weather is highly unpredictable. I also had to make it through the snow this morning. Um, but climate uh, is very predictable. And the good news is there's, there's huge amounts of climate data available. The bad news is, though, that it's extremely difficult for even the experts to extract useful information from those data, which is why we built Fetch Climate. Uh, a very in, it's an intelligent, automatic, and very quick service that lets people extract that, that complex information about the climate, either with just a few lines of code from inside a program or with a few clicks of the mouse through a, a browser. And that's what we're looking at here. So just to show you the sorts of things we can do, since we're in Redmond, we can go and find Redmond on the map. This is running on top of Bing Maps. And so before I, before I came out to Redmond from Cambridge, I could have just clicked on the map and hit Fetch. And what this is doing is it's for the periods, period 1961 to 1990, although we can choose other, other periods, um, it's taking the average temperature at that location. So what's happened there, there is a Silverlight application running in the browser has sent a message to a service running over Azure. Um, that service peruses a number of alternative data sets. It runs the query over all of the data sets that are suitable for that query. It calculates the uncertainty associated with the query, and then by default returns the query that has the lowest uncertainty. So that's quite, there's really quite a lot going on mathematically, a lot of calculations, but Azure lets us do that in a way where those calculations can be farmed out in parallel, and, and, and we're able to reconcile these data sets which at first glance are mutually incompatible and treat them in a common currency and return the answer. So you see we can hover our mouse over here and find out that the average temperature in Redmond is 10.7 uh, degrees C. That's fairly mild. We can do better than that. So we can just choose, since I was coming out in March, I can say, well, what's the average temperature in March in Redmond? 
And again, that fetch will happen. We'll get the answer. We can find out that in Redmond, the average temperature is about 7.2 degrees C in March. And that's what it felt like to me, actually, when I got up this morning. That's fairly, fairly chilly, um, not freezing. Now, we can run um, a number of these uh, points in parallel if we want to. And again, then Azure will simply uh, farm those calculations out. We can see the, uh, the color scheme here matches the temperature. So we can see, although it's 7.2 degrees how we, like we just saw, it gets colder. And all the way up here, the average temperature in March is about minus 2.8, which is uh, a lot colder. I'm just going to clear the regions now and do what's called a grid search. So I can just hold down control and define a region over here. That's putting a grid, which will also be farmed out in parallel. Again, for the same period of years, 1961 to 1990 in March. And then we're actually visualizing the data on top of Bing Maps with another prototype tool from my group called Dynamic Data Display. Um, and so we can see it's very easy then to create a map of temperatures like that, the kind of thing that would, at the moment, even experts would take quite a while to produce a map like that, and ordinary people wouldn't have a hope of even beginning. You can imagine, for instance, if you're planning where to put a hotel in the area, you could use that in, a, in, in that kind of scenario. If you want to share that information to enable others to see the same data, it's literally just as simple as copying the URL. So all of the, the information is contained in the URL. Silverlight application downloads. The query will be populated. And then the calculation will run again. The answer comes back, and we can visualize it. So, it's, so we could, for instance, include that URL in an email and just say, dear such and such, I really don't think that's a good place to put a hotel. Have you, have you checked out the temperatures? And just include that, that link in the email. We can also download the data. So I can download it to my desktop. Just give it a random name for now. And then if I go and open that, you can see all the information that's included in the data. So here's, here's our query, all the query information that we put. We also get provenance back, so it tells us what data was used to fulfill the query, and we get the uncertainty. That's something that even the experts find really hard to place on these kinds of data, but that comes as just a standard part of a, a, fetch, query, a fetch climate query. So let's look at how we could uh, use fetch climate in a kind of planning scenario. Just going to clear that region. So we can imagine that we're the Chinese government, let's say, and we're wondering where we're going to place our wind farms. So we can easily just define a grid over a particular region. And then now I'm just going to choose wind speed for this period, the whole year, etc. Hit fetch. And we can easily see then the wind speed over here is about one point something miles, um, meters per second. But down here, it's more like three. And as, as you all know, the energy goes as the square of the wind speeds. So that means you could expect to get nine times as much energy out of your wind, wind farm if you placed it there. On a slightly more trivial level, you can think about planning a holiday. And if, like me, you're from Britain, you tend to, or indeed Seattle, you tend to crave sunshine. So we can just put a grid over the map now and choose sunshine fraction, hit fetch. We can run a much higher resolution uh, grids here. Everything's editable, so um, the query's configurable in a number of important ways. Mostly we've got some weasel wording here that says, please note, retrieval times can vary. And then we can see here that Spain, for example, at 62% of available sunshine, is over twice as sunny as Britain. <laughs> Helping which uh, helps to explain why Spain is such a popular holiday destination, destination for people from Britain. We perhaps didn't need Fetch Climate to tell us that, but I hope it illustrates uh, the kind of thing it can do. But on a much more serious note, um, we can go to Africa. You've probably heard about uh, African droughts and crops and so on. I can define a region here in Ethiopia and do a different kind of uh, fetch. So instead of a spatial variation here, we can actually do a yearly time series between 1950 to 2009. I happen to know that the data uh, stops uh, prior to 1950. And what this is going, and I'm going to choose precipitation. And so what this is going to do, Fetch Climate is now calculating for that exact region on the map, the total rainfall in each year from 1950 to 2009. I can hover over the map and see certainly what lo looks like a, a worrying uh, pattern of a 60-year decline in rainfall. You can uh, visualize that here as well. This is also dynamic data display running. So uh, Fetch Climate is live. Um, do search for it uh, in Bing. Uh, it takes two or three uh, links to get through. You get an information page, but um, you can get to this um, uh, 
Silverlight application. Uh, to, all you have to do is hold down control to swipe uh, regions. And so give it a go and let us know what you think. Um, but before I hand back to Rick, I've actually prepared something that um, I thought might be interesting or useful for him. Um, so, Rick, the pattern of dots here on, this, on the map, I think, is probably quite familiar to you. And this is I think I've seen that before. Yeah, I think we even saw it a minute ago, didn't yeah, we? Yeah. And so that's each of the Microsoft Research Labs. Um, and what you can do is hover over here and have a look at a typical year's seasonality of uh, rainfall. And I think what you'll find is it tells you that uh, Seattle is the wettest lab most of the time. However, in the middle of the summer, Bangalore and Beijing are really wet. And, uh, and perhaps no surprise, but the Cambridge lab where I'm from is a constant drizzle all year round. Right. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't think we actually had this available when we decided where to put the labs. No. You know, no. So now, I'm, now I'm thinking about Spain. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'll send you that URL in an email, and uh, you can use that when you're planning your next visit. Okay. So. Perfect. All right. Thanks, Drew. Thank Thanks you very much. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. So again, these are these are demos you'll be able to get a chance to, to look at a little bit more when you go out to the to the floor. Uh, and it gives you a sense again of, of the, the ability now to be able to apply, you know, uh, you know, machine learning, mathematics, uh, large-scale computation, uh, and be able to do uh, uh, process huge amounts of data in parallel, and really bring that together to be able to give people real intelligence about about whatever it is that they need to be looking at. In this case, climate. Well, Microsoft Research is really a, a unique asset. Uh, you know, the, we are the number one institution in the world in terms of publishing basic research in computer science. We get more best paper awards than any other organization in the world. Uh, we're, we're really, there's, there's never been anything quite like Microsoft Research in terms of the level of engagement we have with the academic community and the research communities around the world as well. You know, we're, we're global. Uh, we work with, with the universities, we work with research labs, we work with governments around the world, uh, we work with, with other corporations. Uh, we work hard to impact our products and get cutting edge research into our products and really give the company agility. I mean, the reason you have a basic research lab, you know, in some sense isn't, isn't really for the stream of technology that comes out. You get that, right? And that's fabulous and that's, a, that's an important asset to have. Uh, but it's, it's also because you want to survive. When things change, if you've got uh, a new competitor, if you've got uh, a new technology, uh, if the business climate changes in a fundamental way, you want the, the intellectual capital, the people, the treasure chest, of treasure chest of technologies to be available that allows you as a company to rapidly change when change is critical. And Microsoft Research has done that for Microsoft over the years. It's one of the reasons we're still here as a company. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I think we'll continue to be here for a long time to come. We really fuel the future, not just of Microsoft, but really of the technology field. We're, we're increasing our knowledge about the field of computer science in a very fundamental way. And the reality is, is you know, I, I, I'd say if, if 20 years from now, you know, we were still the way we are now, I'd actually be really happy. But if as an organization, you know, we're continuing to push the state of the art, if we still have the same set of values uh, in terms of the way we do our work and how we do it, the way we work with our product teams, the, the, our, our, our determination both to push the state of the art and to make sure that it has an impact on people's lives, if we're still doing that, you know, 20 years from now, I'll be awfully darn happy, assuming I'm still alive. All right, thank you very much.